All right, halfway point, guys. We're almost, we're almost there. Um, so thanks so much for having me. I actually wanted to start out with a question. How many other quantified selfers or people who track their health do we have out there? Can I see some hands? Oh, come on. I know there are more of you than that. No? Okay. Well, if uh, numbers actually serve correctly, 70% of Americans claim to be self-trackers. Um, only about 20% of them use technology right now, which is not surprising when you look at the landscape of what's available. Um, but anyone have any ideas as to what the most popular tracking mechanism is if it's not technology? It's the obvious one. How do my pants fit? How do my clothes fit? Um, so this is actually you know, the way that most people say that they um, you know, know that they're gaining weight, they know how healthy they are, all of that good stuff. Um, but you're probably wondering why on earth would anyone subject themselves to a year of granular tracking of every single health metric and other things that they could possibly think of? Well, just like everyone else in health, I had a personal story. So this is me, I was 27, um, perfectly healthy, no cavities, no broken bones, no nothing. I had a great career in advertising, was working like the 80 hour shift most of the time, um, but you know, never had any meaningful interaction with the healthcare system. Uh, no reason to care, no reason to even really pay attention. You know, I went to my yearly visits, I got my teeth checked, that was all I knew, uh, but then, as things are wont to do in life when you age, things change. So, this is my colon. This is from my very first colonoscopy when I was 27, um, and this lovely little thing in the middle is an ulcer. So I was actually diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, which is, um, if any of you are familiar with IBD, it's an in, uh, irritable bowel disorder. It's chronic, it is genetic, and there was absolutely nothing I could have done to prevent it. So, um, you know, I know that this is like a little squeamish, uh, but you know, I think it's really important, especially for women. If you've got a woman on either side of you and you happen to be a woman, one in three of you will have to deal with IBD or IBS at some point in your life. Um, so I think it's really important that we start to, you know, in this world of HIPAA and, you know, privacy really start to have a more open dialogue about the problems each of us face, especially when, you know, even if they're a little bit embarrassing, which obviously, you know, this is. Um, so, uh, you know, after I finished feeling sorry for myself, which, you know, took a little while, I decided I was really, you know, tired of it and wanted to do something about it. And so that's when I made the big shift into the startup world. I left my you know, quickly rising career in advertising and uh, joined a startup and then found my way to the founding team at Rock Health, which is a startup accelerator uh, in San Francisco that has taken on probably 80 something companies now. I left about a year ago. Um, but you know, companies that are dedicated to building the next generation of software and healthcare services that are really gonna revolutionize the way all of us live. Um, and small side note, so I was donating my body to science for a year, but I am petrified of needles. Like pass out in the doctor's office, kind of scared, freaked out. So it was kind of a big deal for me to overcome all of that as well. Um, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about what I actually did during this year. So I decided I was going to track everything you could possibly imagine. I was going to do blood chemistry tests, genetics, activity tracking, weight, all of that stuff. Um, and then even try some things that I thought perhaps could tell me a bit about my life that weren't health, but were related to stress level or anything like that. And so I actually tracked my calendar. How many hours a week was I spending in meetings? Turns out I spent 41% of my year with scheduled time. That counts sleep and weekends. Um, so I knew that I needed to make some changes in my life after, after this whole period of time concluded. But it was really interesting to kind of try to take all of these seemingly disparate uh, things and actually draw some meaningful conclusions out of it. So most of you have probably seen some of this stuff. This is kind of what is available right now in the quantified self space. Uh, activity trackers, they're all wristbands. I'm not a huge fan of these personally. They kind of get in the way. They're not so convenient when you're typing, not so good when you're you know, in, in a space. But, um, and I think, honestly, this is a big reason that this uh, trend has not really caught on in a mainstream way. It's, uh, it's too active, it takes too much work, um, and it's too difficult to you know, really gain anything meaningful. You just kind of understand how active you are. Um, but it's, it's not the best. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about some companies that I think are doing a tremendous job in really pushing this forward. Um, so what were my requirements? Every experiment requires um, you know, a few uh, different things to, to be consistent. 
Uh, I really believe that people should own their health data. Uh, I don't think that holding it inside of a system is right. Um, so I knew that since I wanted to take so many things that weren't related and put them together, that it needed to be exportable. So that was number one. And number two, what do we all carry with us all the time? So I decided, you know, after trying out most of, the, most of the things in the slide before, that I just wanted to use apps. I wanted to have something that was with me all the time. I wanted it to be passive. I wanted it to be something that was easy to do that I didn't have to constantly remember. And everyone remembers their phone. So what did I actually end up using? I used Livestrong, has a great food encyclopedia. It spits out a file that looks kind of like that. Not the easiest thing on earth to use, but pretty complete. Um, you know, we haven't really figured out a good way to track food yet. It's kind of the last frontier as far as quantified self goes. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day that I can just get something implanted in my stomach, personally. Um, <laughs> but I'm also, you know, perfectly willing to share all of my data and, you know, it doesn't bother me. I think if it can be used for the greater good or if it can be used to help someone not have to go through what I did, that it's, it's a good thing. Um, this is Weathings. This was actually the easiest thing uh, that I interacted with. You know, you put it out somewhere, you step on it in the morning, you're done. It transmits wirelessly, easy. So that was uh, my weight fluctuations. This chart is actually uh, over about a year. And it was pretty interesting to watch. And I'll get to some of the findings in a minute. But I found this to be a really great device. Um, how many of you know what telomeres are? Oh, more than, OK. So it's pretty new science. It's not something that's really readily accessible yet um, to most markets, but um, it's a blood test. And it basically measures the, the ends of your chromosomes, which are your telomeres. And uh, this is a pretty disheartening one for me. Uh, as someone who never even made a, a B until high school, uh, I, I failed this test. My telomeres were in the 37th percentile. I was working a ton at the time. Fortunately, it's reversible, but it actually tells your real biological age, which is really interesting. Um, so, you know, obviously I was older than, uh, older than I actually was at this point in time. So, you know, had to take some measures to actually reverse that eventually. But really interesting stuff. And then this is probably another one that, you know, I wish I'd had years earlier. So, you know, genetic testing is now available to pretty much anyone who wants it. It's like 99 bucks. And had I had this as a child, I probably would have known far sooner that I had this condition. As it stood, I'd had like five years where I was just misdiagnosed. Um, went to doctor after doctor who all said it was IBS. Obviously, it wasn't. So, um, you know, had I had this in my arsenal, I think things would have been a little bit different for me. It's really interesting stuff. All right, so here's the problem. I had all this data, I had all these spreadsheets, I had all this stuff, but this is what it looks like. And I don't know about most of you, but I'm a designer. I am actually not a data scientist. So I had no idea what to do with all of it. There aren't a lot of tools to really take all of this information and make it into something meaningful, to be able to draw conclusions, pull out data, pull out information, things that don't seem related that perhaps are. Um, so you know, we have a ways to go in terms of actually analyzing and, and cracking through this stuff. What did I find? This is actually with a three-month break from coffee. So clearly, I have a little bit of a caffeine problem. That's, that's OK. Um, it was really interesting to see it, though. Um, you know, I know this, of course. You stop paying attention, and you gain weight. And I actually did an experiment. Um, I stopped tracking after my year, and then I went back and revisited my weight. I kept the weathing scale because I kind of just liked it, and I went back and kind of tried to see, you know, how things were going and what was happening. And it turns out I weigh like three pounds more when I'm not paying attention and tracking every single meal. So, and it all makes sense. I mean, Weight Watchers will tell you the same thing. Every study ever done with this stuff will tell you that, you know, if you pay attention to what you eat, you will probably eat better. So. This was probably the greatest gift of everything. After this year of me being you know, very diligent about learning what I knew and you know, figuring out what worked for me and trying to figure out what actually tipped me off, I had a checkup and it turned out I went into remission, which was pretty incredible. Um, you know, UC is a pretty difficult thing to manage. There's no silver bullet, so it was a pretty big deal for me, which was really great. And um, I went into remission, and I learned a lot. And I learned that it's a pain in the ass to track your food every day for every single meal. Not very good socially, either. Um, but you know, it was kind of all worth it in time. 
And I would say the other thing I really learned, you know, as someone who really loves food, um, as anyone who knows me can attest, uh, it was a really difficult thing to be told that I had to change my whole life. Um, getting that diagnosis really just changed the trajectory of how I behaved, what I did, what I ate, where I ate, the way that I ordered my food, everything. Um, and really all of this tracking helped me understand, okay, well, you know, if I do these things right, this is great. And also, like, maybe don't have a whole bowl of guacamole because, you know, like, you know it's not good, but once you understand how bad it really is, you kind of, you know, learn to do more. But, you know, we've still got a ways to go. Um, I think that the technologies to today do a great job of setting a baseline, getting us to a point where we understand our health, but they don't really get us to a place where we actually start changing our behavior because it's still just too hard. It's too much work to manually input everything. It's too much work to really just go in there and keep track of all of that stuff over time. And so I think that what we're gonna see in the next few years from you know, companies making healthcare technologies, et cetera, are you know, really products that start to, to really shift towards this. Personal coaching is one of them. Um, so speaking of the future, let's talk about some companies that are actually doing some really incredible things. So Neurotrack developed the world's first Alzheimer's diagnostic, which is really incredible. So this is an eye tracking test. The top image is a normal subject. So that is how your body, that is how your eyes and your brain actually interpret these two images. The bottom is someone who will develop Alzheimer's in the next three years. So this has been tested, it's been, um, it was developed at Emory University, it's gone through NIH trials, grant funded, the whole thing. Um, it's really incredible and it's been shown to work, it's over 99% accurate. So one of the big problems with Alzheimer's thus far in terms of you know, actually developing a, a cure for it is we can't even um, recruit qualified clinical trial candidates uh, we can't even get people into these trials so that they can actually test these drugs and we know if they work. So really the first thing that Neurotrack is going to do is help us get to a cure. And then someday when there actually is a something that you can do about it, we would all get to you know, do this and hopefully head it off and put an end to this, uh, this disease in general. So Better is a company uh, that I work with actually in Palo Alto, and they are redefining the way that you access and, and get care. So you know, right now, you go to the doctor, you pick up the phone, you make an appointment, you do all this work. Especially in the US, it's not a very uh, efficient system. And this, uh, what they're doing is providing a service that you pick up your phone, you press a button, you get on the phone with a uh, nurse at Mayo Clinic, and they're able to set up appointments for you, get through that first round of triage, and actually start putting you on a path to, um, to more, more effective health, but really democratizing that access. Um, Mayo is not a place that you can just waltz into, and so it's a really neat, uh, neat way to reimagine kind of how we all access medical care. Um, this one's really cool. So we, I talked a little bit about uh, you know, the wristbands. Nothing against those guys. I think it's really important that we go through this, uh, you know, this phase of that development. But MC10, these are little, they look like little gold tattoos. They're stickers. And they can detect vital signs, hydration levels, all kinds of incredible things. And it's completely passive. It's low cost. It's really incredible stuff. So their first product is actually in partnership with Reebok. And it is a um, concussion monitor, so it's to help athletes. It's a little thing you wear under your helmet, mostly for football players right now, and it can actually detect whether or not you are going to get a concussion. So, you know, a little light will go off and you can stop your practice at that point. Um, so I think that they're on to something really, really huge. They're out of Cambridge, uh, really incredible company. These conformal electronics that just bend and move with the human body instead of, you know, fighting it and being this kind of hard plastic uh, form factor. So I started with a question, and I think I'd like to end with one, which is, what is the future of food going to be? Um, you know, in the next 30 years, we are going to have 2 billion more people on this planet. Agriculture is going to have to speed up about 70% to keep up, and protein is really the hardest thing. So um, there are a lot of people in Silicon Valley right now trying to figure out ways to hack meat, you know, synthetic meats. There's some stuff going on in London right now, same thing. Why not insects? Um, it's not a thing that we do in the U.S. yet, uh, but around the world, if you travel, uh, odds are you will run into a culture, probably many, that already have insects as part of their diet. So if you check out the New York Times tomorrow, there's going to be an article about a company called Chirp that is rethinking the way that we consume insects as a f form of protein. 
through a flower, which is really, really interesting stuff. So I will leave you with eating bugs. How many of you would eat bugs? Sweet. We have an, oh, we have a, we have an open audience. Um, and Chicago is such a great food town, so I, I uh, hope it comes here, uh, here first. I've been, I've been all over the place eating Frontera and uh, Little Goat Grill or Diner or whatever and Publican tonight, so it's, uh, it's a great place. But um, I think that you know, we have to think creatively in order to keep up with what's going on. Um, but thank you. Thank <laughs> you.